Hi, it's Ken Rimple, uh, Training and Mentoring Director for Chariot Solutions, and I want to show you how to install a profiling tool called NSolid from NodeSource. Um, they're at nodesource.com. Uh, it's a free tool for developers. You cost money to license it for production, but it's a tool that can let you take a look at your applications under load and profile them for Node.js and give you a real good idea of what's going on when you try to do your work. Now, if you look at the uh, web page, you'll notice that you can download uh, pre-built binaries. Uh, so they've already got a install for Ubuntu or Debian. They've got one for Red Hat, Enterprise Linux, Fedora, and CentOS, and for Mac OS. Uh, Windows users, I think you're going to probably ultimately install it as the Ubuntu under Windows uh, integration, uh, which gives you a bash shell, but I'm not sure that's ready yet. So you click on the download link, it gives you your NSolid developer bundle, and you're good to go. Okay, so let's take a look at the setup process. It installs a command called nsolid console. You'll hit localhost 3000 to access it. Um, and then you're gonna go through your typical developer setup on Mac. It asks what volume to put it on, type in your credentials, and you go through the installation process. Pretty straightforward. And again, at the end, we have nsolid console and localhost 3000. So to kick it off, we just run that one command. That's new in 1.4. Uh, before you had to launch three different commands. So next we're going to want to run the nsolid console. Uh, again, you type the nsolid console command, which it's placed in your path when you open a new terminal. Also, you'll notice that there's a source command at the bottom that you can add to your bash shell or z shell in order to get all the path variables set correctly when you use nsolid. And so if we browse over to the uh, localhost 3000, uh, we'll see the nsolid console application fire up. It's now at this point waiting for us to attach an application so we can monitor it. Before we get started, we want to make sure that we create a set of environment variables. And it may make sense for us to just do this uh, as we need it, since most of the time we don't need to profile our application. So in that case, that was the command source, user local nsolid nsolid env. You'll notice what it does is it puts it in front of the path uh, and that now you've got nsolid and npm and also by the way node uh, from the nsolid directory uh, all set to go. When you're done you can either exit the shell or type restore to go to your previous state. In this demo we're going to launch an application. It's just a simple node command line um, and in order to launch it properly we want to give it a couple environment variables. One is called nsolid hub that is the default recording hub for nsolid that is on the port 2379. And then also giving it an nsolid app name, which we're just going to call foo, so that we can actually track what's going on with our app in the nsolid console. All right, now as I go back to the console, you'll notice that it identified my foo application, and it states that it has one process. And you'll notice that uh, on the bottom left here, we've got a, kind of a two-axis graph, memory, uh, percent of heap used by the node instance, as well as CPU percentage used. And there's that little tiny dot on the bottom left. That is our actual node instance. Okay, armed with our tools, now we are able to kick off some sort of script that generates a load. And I have just a uh, silly little script that I've written. I'm going to run it as an anonymous function so I can show it to you before we kick it off. Here it is. And so this is a function that automatically runs, that runs this block of code. And in the block of code, we create an event emitter in Node. Uh, the event emitter is just something that can basically implement the observer pattern. It uh, lets you create events by emitting them and then picking them up on the other side with a listener. So our code basically follows that form. We get the constructor for event emitter from the required events. We then create a new event emitter for these events. We then generate a function called load generator, and it concatenates a string and a math uh, square root to a array, which it will then garbage collect each time it runs and finishes, which should generate some memory as well as CPU load. Uh, then we have a listener that we add to the emitter for the ping message, and that ping message is processed by that load generator we just defined. So now the stage is set. We're able to actually go ahead and create load uh, we're going to basically do this through a set interval. And I'm taking advantage of the interval handle that comes back so I can cancel it 10 seconds later. 
but essentially we do a set interval with an anonymous function. That anonymous function emits ping every 50 milliseconds. And then we have a set timeout, and the set timeout after 10 seconds calls clear interval on the interval which stops the process. So the second I hit enter here, this gives us a start generating load. And we can see now in nSolid that our node is picking up some memory and it is picking up some processing. If I were to expand this out, after 10 seconds it should go down. Um, now that's done, okay? But after 10 seconds we can see what our load profile was. So we're really looking in this range right here. This is the range right here. But that's not really telling me the whole story. I really wanna see what's happening, what the actual sequence events are, uh, what kind of processing and load it's taking. So what I can do is go in here and kick off a new profiling event. The profiling event can watch this thing over, let's say, a 15 second time cycle. Um, let me just make this a little larger. And so we're gonna do 15 seconds of profiling. We're gonna just output this. Let's do it as a sunburst. That's kind of an interesting uh, view of it. And then we'll click Start Profile. But before we do, let me refresh my script. Start my profile, hit Enter. And now it should be going. Let's go back here and wait for it to complete. Uh, this is kind of like a Pac-Man looking thing, which in that kind of shape means that most of the work is being done by one thing. And that makes sense because the bulk of our work is done by the load generator. If we go back and look at this, that's consuming CPU and memory. We're only looking at CPU at the moment. It's interesting also that it, we emit it from request work and request work was is submitted through the REPL. You see REPL right there. And there's the request work function. You'll notice I named my function, and that's really important when you profile. Um, everyone loves anonymous functions, and they're, they're useful, but if you do profiling, you may want to name some of those anonymous functions so you can find them during the profiling process. Now also, I can look at this a couple different ways. Uh, and so lets me see this in a flame graph. All these are going to tell me basically the same thing, that in the aggregate, most of our time was spent in load generator with a little bit of time spent in other places, uh, kind of housekeeping uh, stuff. Same thing with tree map. Most of our time is a load generator, um, and wrapping that whole thing somewhere in here is request work. Tricky one, isn't it? So sometimes it's hard to get the right view from here kind of illustrated by the, the difficulty in navigating a very powerfully consuming function with hardly anything else running. So we want to look at this actually as a series of events over time too. So you don't really get that directly from NSolid easily. So that's why they provide the download profile. And this is going to give us um, our foo. Um, let's say we're um, doing event emitter um, 10 seconds sync. And so this is going to give us an actual timeline view because we're going to go into our debugging tools. And I used a uh, command alt J on the Mac. It's control shift J on windows, et cetera, F12. Um, and we're going to go to our profiles and click load and pick this new 10 second sync CPU profile right here. Now the cool thing about this is I can really get in and take a look at all the time that was taken by the work, but let's dig deeper into this profile. So, what you can do is you can move over and drag on the timeline. And by the way, if you're not in the timeline, you can change this drop down in the profiler. You might be sitting on the statistical uh, from the bottom up or from the top down view. So let's go to the chart. And you'll notice I can dig in a little bit and take a look and see what's going on. You see these nice little gaps of idle time that are being caused by our set timeout every time, uh, I'm sorry, set interval, and every time we emit something, uh, we are giving ourselves a little bit of time to recover from it before we emit the next one. So work gets done, there's a little idle time. Work gets done, there's a little idle time. And so that is just gonna make this more efficient. If you're you know, running multiple jobs, for example, and you want them to cooperate with each other, uh, they may be able to compete if you break them up into little chunks like this, uh, sending different events to different job processes. Definitely good for a server. If you're doing an ETL process to load data to a database, eh, you know, maybe you do want the maximum amount of speed. So you'll reduce that idle time. 
So this time we're just going to use a loop. Uh, we're not even going to use a timer. So this really gives it absolutely zero time to recover from the processing. And let's see what happens. So for 15 seconds, this is now running uh, a profile. And it's watching what's happening. So we're throwing 1,000 events on the emitter. And then when it's finished, we're going to take a look at what it does. And so I picked the tree map view by default. That doesn't really tell us much, except for the fact that 99% of the time, or I should say 94.85% of the time, it's doing the load generator uh, work, which is all the grunt work of all of what we're doing. All right, so that's very, very busy. Uh, there's some housekeeping work around it, but the better way to view this is probably the flame graph view. So we can kind of walk up the call stack um, and eventually we're going to find here an emit that is called by somewhere in here. Yeah, so it's even hard to see where this is. Realistically, this is just bursting a ton of data, and it's not really giving the CPU a chance to recover from these requests between them. Uh, to prove that, we're going to download our profile. Uh, we're going to call this foo burst mode. We're going to open up the Chrome developer tools. And we're going to load that by going to uh, profiles, load. Pick up burst mode here. And you're going to see that this thing has a floor uh, of non-activity that, that basically doesn't exist. If I dig into this, the entire time, this was one on read, and I believe, if I'm right about this, is this is the for loop that has been executed. So we realistically have no time to do anything but process our actual load generator calls and emit them. And there's probably the anonymous function in the REPL. In fact, it does say line one of the REPL. Uh, most likely that's it. Um, that actually kicks off the uh, for loop. So no time to garbage collect, no time to do anything else. Maybe there's a little time to garbage collect here. Yep, there it is. So it took a whole couple seconds realistically to get to a garbage collection. A second here, a second there. Uh, which means if there's a lot of data being done, your garbage collector uh, will not get enough time to clear it and you'll possibly run out of memory. And if you don't run out of memory, you're gonna burn the CPU up. So that's very inefficient. Whenever you see a pattern that looks like this, like a shelf, uh, that means that it is intensely busy with no time for break. And what we're talking about with the word it is the event loop. And in Node, you get one event loop for node processes. Uh, each node process has its own. And when it's busy, it's busy. Nothing else can happen, as we're seeing here. So the only saving grace we have is that we're using the event emitter, which gives us a little tiny bit of time between the event processes to do something, but we're not even giving it a chance to let up. Now, if your job in this node entry is to work off a bunch of events from a file or something, this is fine. But in a web application, you want to give it room. I want to go back to a contrast uh, between the heavy CPU profiling and the one where we were using the set timeout. Even if you decide for whatever reason that you want to um, perhaps do as many of the processes as possible. Uh, so for example, you want to set the timeout to almost nothing. You will still be much more efficient in terms of letting Node keep track of itself and do its work than you will by just doing a, a blistering for loop. What you're going to lose in that is, of course, the raw number of transactions or calls per second. Uh, you're probably going to be a fraction of the number you could do in a tight loop. But if you're trying to service multiple clients, you really should never do code like that in event uh, emitter in a tight loop because you're going to kill uh, the event loop. So let's take a look at the profile uh, again, this time uh, using code where we get rid of the interval from set timeout. So it's literally the next tick or the next turn. Uh, and the fact is, that even with that, Let's look at the, the curve in the profiler and see how much better that is than that giant floor of all CPU activity before. Um, 
The downside of doing it this way, uh, because it's more um, resource friendly, is that it's only going to give me 191 of these in 10 seconds. Um, that's probably way less than if we did a direct for loop and we burn through all of them at once. But at the same time, looking at the difference, again, here's what that looks like. Okay, so we still have a lot of idle time to do other work, which means we have the garbage collector cleaning up much more often, so we're not wasting a lot of memory sitting there that can't be freed. And so let's compare that by loading it with another one here. All right, let's go back and let's do the burst mode, and it's like night and day. You know, you wouldn't get any other work done on this node instance if you were trying to do this um, processing of the event, processing of the uh, event emitter the way we did it with a for loop. So you don't want to write code like that if you have a multi-user node instance. If you're doing ETL and you're processing one job at a time, sure, that's different. Uh, so you just have to know what you're going for and apply the right type of call to the right job. Um, so what we're talking about with, with yielding using a set timeout uh, or a set interval, same thing could be true with you know using uh, libraries that are friendly for multiple users that do things um, asynchronously with promises um, or observables or things like that, and where they're built to yield time back with timeouts and things like that. If you found all that useful, uh, I appreciate you watching. Uh, we are ChariotSolutions.com. Uh, we are a consulting firm that does open source software development in Java, Scala, AngularJS, Hadoop, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, we are available on the web at ChariotSolutions.com. Read more uh, about technologies we follow and work with every day, such as Angular 2. Uh, we look at things like um, Scala, uh, Reactive, uh, Internet of Things, you name it, and that's at ChariotSolutions.blog. blog. We also have our training and mentoring programs, which I run. We're currently uh, shopping around for uh, students for Angular 2 workshops, as well as a fast track to Scala, which we do with our partner, Lightbend. And even, in addition to that, some work on Swift. So head over to chariotsolutions.com slash training. And we also run the Philly Emerging Technologies for the Enterprise Conference. If you go to our screencasts, you will find a category there called ETE 2016. And there you can watch probably about 30 at this point of our different videos from the show. All right, you can reach me on Twitter at krimple, and of course we just talked about nsolid from node source. Thank you for your time.